Welcome, brave reader. I present to you a chilling collection telling about the dark corners of urban legends and myths from all over the world. These pages contain stories that are told in whispers in candlelit rooms and around crackling bonfires. Here, the line between the ordinary and the unusual is blurred, revealing stories about mystical creatures that hide from prying eyes, about enchanted places where the laws of nature are violated, and about ancient curses that haunt the unwary. I always thought the tales of Whispering Woods were just ghost stories, concocted by the elders to keep us out of the dense forest at the edge of our town. But that was before the night we went in. There were four of us. Jake, Emily, Lucas, and me, Anna. We were thrill-seekers, hungry for a taste of the unknown, craving the rush of fear. It was Lucas who dared us that foggy evening. The mist clung to our clothes like wet fingers as we stood at the forest's threshold, the trees looming like silent sentinels. Come on, Lucas whispered, a grin splitting his face. Let's see if the whisper walkers are real. We pushed past the creaking branches, our flashlights cutting swaths through the thick fog. The deeper we went, the eerier the woods became. Shapes seemed to shift in the periphery of our vision, and the silence was suffocating. Anna, a voice murmured, so faint I thought I'd imagined it. I stopped, straining to listen. The others walked on ahead, their voices and footsteps fading. Anna. The voice came again, closer this time. It was my mother's voice. But that was impossible. She had died when I was a child. My heart pounded in my chest as the voice continued to call, coaxing me deeper into the woods. Guys, wait up, I called, but my voice was swallowed by the forest. Panic gripped me as I realized I was alone. I turned, intending to head back. But which way had we come? Anna, this way the voice urged, and against my better judgment I followed. The fog grew thicker, the world narrowing to a small bubble around me. The voice continued to call, a siren song that pulled me forward. Then through the mist I saw figures, shadowy faceless forms that moved with eerie grace. Whisper walkers. I stumbled back, my breath coming in ragged gasps. The figures halted and then, impossibly, began to mimic the laughter of my friends. Lucas! I called out desperate. The figures moved closer, their forms becoming more defined. They were the exact shapes of my friends, but their faces were smooth, blank slates. Anna, come, they said in unison, using the voices of Jake, Emily, and Lucas. I turned and ran, branches whipping against my face as I bolted through the undergrowth. I didn't stop even as the voices continued to call my name, pleading, threatening. The fog began to clear and I burst out of the forest, collapsing on the ground. Moments later, the real Jake, Emily, and Lucas emerged, their faces etched with concern. We heard you scream, Emily said. We've been looking for you. I looked back at the forest, half expecting to see those faceless figures at the tree line, but there was nothing. Let's go home. I said, voice shaking. We never spoke of that night again. But sometimes, when the fog rolls in and the air grows cold, I hear my mother's voice calling me. Whispering secrets meant only for the depths of whispering woods. And I wonder if, perhaps next time, I'll follow it again. As a paranormal investigator, I had wandered into the darkest corners of haunted houses and abandoned asylums, but nothing ever fascinated me as much as the legend of Elmsbury Bridge. It was said that every night at midnight, the shadow of a person appeared, pacing endlessly across the bridge. This shadow belonged to someone who had jumped from the bridge decades ago, trapped forever in a loop of their last moments. My fascination grew into obsession, and I decided to capture evidence of this phenomenon. Armed with cameras and sensors, I set up my equipment on the chilly night of October 5th, a date marking the anniversary of the tragic jump. The bridge, an old structure of stone and rusting metal, creaked eerily as the wind blew through it. I stationed cameras at both ends and in the middle, where the ghost was reportedly most visible. As the clock neared midnight, an unnatural chill settled over the area, and the soft murmur of the river below seemed to hush in anticipation. 
Midnight struck, and through my night vision camera, I saw it, a shadowy figure emerging from the mist at one end of the bridge. It moved slowly, with a palpable heaviness like every step was a burden. I held my breath watching as the figure reached the midpoint of the bridge, the exact spot where the legend said the person had leapt to their death. Suddenly the temperature dropped, and my breath misted in the cold air. The figure stopped and turned as if aware of my presence. My heart raced. It was a moment I had not anticipated. Shadows weren't supposed to know you were watching. Then, in a voice that echoed in the still night, it spoke, a sound like gravel scraping over stone. Why do you disturb the restless? It asked. I was stunned into silence, unsure how to respond. I... I wanted to understand your story, I finally managed to stammer out. The figure resumed its slow march across the bridge. Some tales, it murmured, are too sorrowful to be retold, too painful to be relived. It stopped again at the very edge of the bridge, turning to face the dark waters below. I approached cautiously, my camera recording every moment. Can you find peace? I asked, my voice a whisper against the rustling of the trees. It glanced back at me, and for a fleeting second, I saw a face twisted in anguish and despair. Then it stepped off the bridge, disappearing before it hit the water, gone like it had never been there. Shaken, I reviewed the footage, only to find that every frame of the shadow's appearance was blurred, as if smeared by tears. The only clear shot was the empty bridge after it had vanished. As dawn broke, I packed up my equipment, the weight of the encounter heavy on my shoulders. I realized then that some ghosts aren't bound merely by the tragedy of their deaths but by the memory of their despair, replayed each night for an audience of none. Now, when I tell the story of Elmsbury Bridge, it's not just a tale of a haunted spot. It's a somber reminder of the shadows we cast, the pain we carry and the hope that even the most tormented spirits might someday find their way back from the brink. When we moved into the old Cartwright mansion in Maryvale, it was supposed to be a fresh start, far from the bustling noise and clutter of the city. The mansion, with its sprawling gardens and labyrinthine corridors, was steeped in a kind of silent grandeur that only centuries can bestow. Yet from the first night, an air of mystery cloaked the ancient halls, a whisper of something untold. It was my daughter, Lila, who found the mirror. Tucked away in a forgotten room filled with veiled furniture and cobwebbed windows, the mirror stood, an ornate relic framed in gilded vines. Unlike the rest of the house's treasures, it was pristine, as if someone had been tending to it. You mustn't spend too much time with that old thing, I warned her. But Lila, with the obstinate fascination of a curious child, was drawn to it. She said it made her feel less lonely that the girl in the mirror kept her company. One evening I walked past the room to find her whispering fervently into the glass. Who are you talking to, Lila? I asked, a chill threading down my spine despite my rational mind. The girl who knows everything, she replied, eyes wide and distant. She shows me things. What things? I pressed, a tremor in my voice. Things that are going to happen, she whispered back a shadow flickering across her face. As days unfurled, Lila became increasingly distant, her moments spent away from the mirror growing fewer. She spoke of visions, fragments of events yet to come, tales of fires, storms, and shadows creeping through our very door. Determined to break the mirror's hold, I ventured one night to see it for myself. The mansion was quiet, save for the distant echo of the wind against the windows. The mirror's surface shimmered as I approached, and for a moment, I hesitated, my reflection gazing back at me. Then it shifted. It wasn't my face staring back, but scenes of deep, terrifying clarity. I saw our house engulfed in flames, I saw darkness creeping over the sunny gardens, turning them wilted and gray, and I saw Lila, her eyes hollow, her spirit chained to the depths of the mirror's glass. I recoiled in horror, realizing the truth. The mirror didn't just predict fate, it created it. Each vision it showed fed on fear, weaving it into the threads of reality, binding the viewer to an inescapable destiny. 
Panic seized me. We had to leave. I raced to Lila's room, bursting through the door, only to find it empty, the window open to the churning darkness outside. Lila! I screamed into the night. No answer. My heart pounding, I rushed back to the mirrored room. The glass was calm now, my own panicked reflection staring back. But as I watched, it changed. Lila appeared behind the glass, her hand pressed to the surface. Mom? She said, her voice muffled, as if from a great distance. You can't change what's already been done. You can't undo fate. I pounded on the glass, tears streaming down my face. Come back, I cried. Please come back. But the image faded, leaving me alone with my reflection in the silent house. In the weeks that followed, I searched tirelessly for Lila, but it was as if she had vanished into thin air. The police found nothing. Friends and family mourned her as gone. But I knew the truth. She was trapped, a prisoner of her own fate as shown by the cursed mirror. Now I sit before the mirror each night, staring into its depths. It shows me nothing anymore, no fate, no visions of the future. Perhaps it no longer needs to. It has what it wanted. But I will keep watching, keep waiting. For the day it might show me how to bring her back. Until then, the mirror of Maryvale holds us both, forever caught in its reflection. I had always been drawn to the unexplainable, the tales that others dismissed as mere urban legends. Subway Line 9's Car Zero was just such a story, too deliciously sinister to pass up. They called it the Cursed Subway Car, a phantom train that appeared only at the stroke of midnight, swallowing any who dared enter never to be seen again. As a journalist, skepticism was my trade, yet curiosity was my vice. On a fog-shrouded autumn night, I stood alone on the platform of the terminal station of Line 9. The digital clock overhead ticked toward midnight, each minute stretching like taffy in my apprehensive mind. Workers and late-night travelers had long since vanished, leaving me in an eerie solitude, accompanied only by the hum of the distant city. As the clock struck twelve, a chill rippled through the air, and the station lights flickered ominously. Then, with the silence of a specter, it appeared. Car Zero. It was unlike any other in the fleet. Its paint was an abyssal black, windows darkened, save for a faint, eerie glow from within. The doors slid open with a hiss, an invitation, or a dare. Stepping into Car Zero, I was immediately enveloped by an oppressive cold. The seats, upholstered in a tattered velvet, were empty, and the air was thick with the musty tang of decay. As the doors sealed behind me, a disquieting lurch set the car in motion. The normal electric hum of a subway was absent, replaced by a deep, resonant silence that seemed to echo with the whispers of the lost. The car trundled through the tunnels, the passage of time becoming ambiguous. Minutes? Hours? The concept lost meaning as I peered into the darkness beyond the glass. Shadows seemed to flicker and twist, forming spectral shapes that danced just beyond the edge of sight. Suddenly, the train screeched to a halt. The lights flickered violently, casting jagged shadows across the compartment. When they steadied, I was no longer alone. Figures shrouded in tattered garments stood silent, their faces obscured by the gloom. Their presence was oppressive suffocating as if the very air dreaded their touch. One moved toward me, its movements jerky and unnatural. As it approached, a cold dread settled in my chest. Its face, if it could be called that, was a void. No features, just a swirling dark mist. Its hand, a gnarled appendage, reached out, brushing against my arm. The touch was icy, searing into my flesh like frostbite. Right, it hissed, a voice like the rustle of dry leaves. Confusion warred with fear as it pressed an old, worn notebook into my hands. The pages, yellowed with age, were filled with stories, entries of those who had boarded Car Zero before me. As I flipped through the pages, realization dawned. Each story was a confession, a last testament of a soul about to be consumed by the darkness of Car Zero. The figures around me, the lost, they were bound here, eternally trapped in their final story. Understanding the grim fate that awaited, I began to write. 
My words, a mixture of fear and resignation, flowed onto the page. As I wrote, the figures drew closer, their silent watch pressing upon me. Finishing, I felt an overwhelming exhaustion claim me. The train jolted again and I awoke to find myself back at the terminal station, the first rays of dawn piercing the gloom. Car Zero was gone as if it had never existed. Shaken, I exited the platform clutching the notebook, a tangible proof of the night's horrors. But as I flipped to my entry, my blood turned to ice. The page was blank. No trace of my words remained. Instead, at the bottom of the page, a new message appeared, written in a hand not my own. Some stories are too dark to be told, but too sinister to be forgotten. And so, I leave this account a warning. Beware the allure of the unknown, for some truths are better left unexplored.